Hi, this is Deepa Ganeshram. Welcome to the first review session. We are going to be looking at the solutions to the first test that you took. The test was on the theoretical framework of accounting. So let's get started. The first question is, accounting of a small calculator as an expense and not as an asset is in accordance with option A, full disclosure principle, objectivity principle, accounting period assumption, none of the above. The answer to this question is none of the above because accounting of a small calculator as an expense and not as an asset is in accordance with the principle of materiality. The cost of an expense or the cost of uh, a calculator in relation to the uh, size of the business is small as is given in the question and hence it does not warrant capitalization and subsequent depreciation and hence in accordance with the materiality principle the business has treated this calculator as an expense and not as an asset. So answer is D. Second question, accounting standards, option A, harmonize accounting policies, eliminate the non-comparability of financial statements, improve the reliability of financial statements, all of the above. See accounting standards are broad policy guidelines that are issued by the ICAI which help the companies in deciding what accounting policies are, permissi are permissible okay, to account for various assets, liabilities, incomes and expenses. Why are these accounting standards issued? These accounting standards are issued so that accounting policies are harmonized, so that comparability of financial statements is enhanced and it also improve, improves the reliability of the financial statements. So the answer to this question is D all of the above. Question number three. Accounting standards in India are issued by A. The Board of Studies ICAI, the Accounting Standards Board ICAI, the Expert Advisory Committee ICAI, the International Accounting Standards Committee IASC. Well the answer is B. In India the body that's responsible for issuing accounting standards is the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. There is a body that's constituted under the ICAI which is called the Accounting Standards Board and hence B is the answer. Okay, now question number four. All of the following are functions of accounting except A. Decision making, B. Measurement, C. Forecasting and D. Ledger posting. The options A, B and C are the functions of accounting while D, ledger posting, is an accounting activity. Accounting is a system which involves the accounting process and ultimately at the end of the accounting process what we have are the financial statements which is nothing but a profit and loss account and balance sheet. These financial statements aid the users in decision making in measurement and also make an informed judgment of how the business is likely to be in the near future, which is nothing but forecasting. But ledger posting is not a function of accounting, it is an accounting activity. So the answer is D. Right. The fifth question. All the following items are classified as fundamental accounting assumptions except A. Consistency B. Business entity C. Going concern D. Accrual Okay. Fundamental accounting assumptions according to accounting standard 1 are consistency, going concern and accrual. So the accounting standard 1 very clearly spells out that these three are the fundamental accounting assumptions that have to be followed by any business when the financial statements are prepared and presented. So going by that, B is the odd one out and hence B is the answer to this question. Business entity is not a fundamental accounting assumption. Question number six. As per accounting standard one, the fact must be disclosed with reason in the financial statements if the following concept is not followed. A. Money measurement principle. B. Accounting entity principle. C. Accounting period principle. And D. Going concern. Accounting standard 1 gives us the fundamental accounting assumptions as going concern, consistency and the accrual concept. Accounting standard 1 further states that 
a business has to follow these accounting assumptions when it prepares its financial statements. So, if a business has prepared its financial statements in accordance with these fundamental accounting assumptions, no specific disclosure with respect to having followed these accounting assumptions is required. Only if a business does not follow any one of these three fundamental accounting assumptions, a disclosure is required with respect to why it has not followed a fundamental accounting assumption and what is the basis on which the accounts have been prepared. So, the answer to this question is D. If a business has not followed the going concern assumption while preparing its financial statements, that fact must be disclosed with reason in the financial statements. Question number 7 is again a modification of question number 6. It says, as per accounting standard 1, the fact need not be disclosed in the financial statements if the following concepts is followed. Right? So, materiality principle, money measurement principle, accounting entity principle and accrual. These are the four options that are available to us. We know that accrual is a fundamental accounting assumption and if you have prepared your financial statements following the accrual system of accounting, that fact need not be disclosed because it is a fundamental accounting assumption. So the answer is D. Question number 8. Bookkeeping is mainly concerned with option A. Recording of financial data. B. Designing the systems in recording, classifying and summarizing the recorded data. C. Interpreting the data for internal and external users. D. None of these above. See, bookkeeping is a subset in the entire process of accounting. Bookkeeping is a portion or it's a part of the entire accounting process. What is the accounting process? Accounting process starts with identifying financial transactions, measuring the financial transactions, recording them, then classifying them, summarizing them, analyzing and interpreting the financial information and finally communicating them to the users of the financial information. Right. So the first four steps that are involved in the accounting process, namely identifying, measuring, recording and classifying are together called bookkeeping. So bookkeeping primarily involves just recording the financial data. So the answer is A. Question number nine. Capital brought in by the proprietor is an example of A increase in asset and increase in liability b increase in liability and decrease in asset c increase in asset and decrease in liability d increase in one asset and decrease in another liability. asset sorry the answer to this question is a capital brought in by the proprietor is an example of increase in asset and increase in liability we must understand the concept of duality or the dual aspect concept this is the concept on which the entire double entry system of accounting hinges, which means that every transaction has got two effects, a debit effect and a credit effect. They are equal, but they are opposite. When capital is brought in by the proprietor, the liability of the business increases because the business is under an obligation to return the capital to the proprietor. Hence, the capital brought in by, by the proprietor is a liability to the business. And the capital that the proprietor brings in can be in the form of cash or in the form of an asset that he brings. So the asset also increases. So the answer is A. It results in increase in asset and increase in liability. Now let's look at question number 10. Consider the following data pertaining to X Limited. Cost of machinery purchased on 1st April 2006 is rupees 1 lakh. Installation charges is 10,000. Market value as on 31st March 2007, which should be 2007, lakh and 20,000. While finalizing the annual accounts, if the company values the machinery at lakh and 20,000 rupees, which of the following concepts is violated by X Limited? The options are A. Cost, B. Matching, C realization and D periodicity. X Limited has violated a concept called the historical cost concept or the cost concept. 
question. Which means that fixed assets are normally recorded in the books of accounts at the cost in which they were acquired. So in this case, X Limited should have capitalized or shown the asset at lakh and ten thousand rupees, but X Limited has shown lakh and twenty thousand rupees, which is the market value of the asset. Hence, the concept violated is the historical cost concept. Question number eleven: Decrease in the amount of creditors results in a increase in cash, b decrease in cash, c increase in assets, d no change in assets. This again is an understanding of the dual aspect of accounting or the duality principle of accounting where there is a decrease in a liability and we want to know how it, what is the other impact on the asset or in the liability. Right? So let's take an example. Let's assume that at the beginning of the year the business owed 20,000 rupees to its creditors and at the end of the year it owes say 5,000 rupees to its creditors, which means the creditors have decreased by 15,000 rupees. Why have they decreased? It's because, it's probably because the business has paid them. And so when the business pays them, cash goes down. So decrease in the amount of creditors results in decrease in cash. Answer is B. Right. During the year 2006, Mr. X purchased goods for rupees 5 lakhs and he sold Three fifths of the goods for rupees five lakhs and net expenses amounting to rupees lakh and fifty thousand. He accounted for net profit as rupees fifty thousand. Which of the following accounting concepts was followed by him? Yeah, so let's uh, do a small calculation to understand how he has arrived at the profit of fifty thousand rupees. Right. So the sales that so the sales that he has made is rupees five lakhs. We know that profit is selling price minus the cost price. So the cost is nothing but the cost of purchases that he has made. But we must keep in mind that we must not subtract the entire 5 lakhs from the sale value of 5 lakhs because he has not sold everything. He has sold only 3 fifths of what he bought, which means 3 fifths of the purchase cost that he incurred is 3 lakhs. So the gross profit that X has made on the sale is 2 lakhs. He has incurred further expenses of rupees, rupees lakh and 50,000. And therefore, he is accounted for a net profit of 50,000 rupees. Okay. So what has he done here? He has subtracted 3 lakhs from 5 lakhs. He has subtracted the expense that he has incurred to make that particular sale. So he has followed a concept called the matching concept. He has matched the revenue with the expense that has been incurred to earn that particular revenue. It would be wrong to subtract 5 lakhs from the entire sale value of 5 lakhs because you have not incurred 5 lakhs to make a sale of 5 lakhs. Right? What has actually been spent is, or what is relatable to the sale of 5 lakhs is only 3 lakhs. So that is the matching concept. So answer is C. Okay, question number 13. Financial accounting information is characterized by all of the following except A. It is historical in nature. B. It is factual, so it does not require judgment to prepare. C. It results from inexact and appropriate measures. D. It is enhanced by management's explanation. Right. So financial accounting, the basic characteristic of financial accounting is that it is historical in nature. Right. If we look at the balance sheet and the profit and loss account of any business, it does not contain any forecast profit and loss account or it does not contain any forecast balance sheet. The information that we get is the balance sheet as at a particular date, the profit and loss account for a particular period, and we can also see the comparable or the comparative numbers for the previous years. So the information that are presented by the financial statements that are as a result of the financial accounting process are purely historical in nature. It would be wrong to say that financial accounting is factual and it does not require judgment to prepare because 
there are many items that affect the financial statements where a lot of estimation is required. For example, estimating the useful lives of the asset, deciding what method of depreciation to be used for a particular asset, whether SLM or WDU, deciding upon the pattern of the benefits that the asset generates in order to decide whether to depreciate it using the SLM or the WDU, making an estimate of how much debtors would go bad, making an estimate of how much discount you would have to give the debtors when they settle your amounts. So all these are some examples where the accountant has to exercise judgment or use estimates. So it would be wrong to say that it is factual. It results from inexact and appropriate measures, yes, and it is enhanced by management's explanation. That is also a characteristic of financial accounting. So B, which says that financial accounting is factual, is not a characteristic of financial accounting. And hence the answer is B. Right. Question number 14. Financial statements only consider A. Assets expressed in monetary terms. B. Liabilities expressed in monetary terms. C. Assets expressed in non-monetary terms. D. Assets and liabilities expressed in monetary terms. So in relation to this question, financial statement would mean a balance sheet. Right? A balance sheet records the assets and the liabilities and only those assets and liabilities which are capable of being measured in terms of money. Right? The loyalty of a workforce or the uh, intelligence of uh, a group of inventors in a company like say Google or Microsoft is not uh, does not find a place in the balance sheet of a company. So answer is D. Right. Question number 15. Match the following items from column A with column B. Right. So column A gives us four different concepts and we have to match their meanings in column B. So let's look at the first concept. It says consistency. Consistency means consistently following accounting policies year after year. The business is not allowed to change its accounting policies year after year unless it is warranted by an accounting standard or it's warranted by a statute or if the management itself feels that it is better to change the accounting policy for better presentation and preparation of financial statements, then it is allowed to change its accounting policy. So that is the principle of consistency. The second concept is money measurement. Money measurement means all assets, liabilities, incomes, expenses which are capable of being expressed in terms of money alone are shown in the financial accounting statements or they, they find their place in the financial accounting process. Then we come to the entity concept. Entity concept means there is the business is a separate economic entity. There has to be a clear demarcation between the activities of the business and the personal transactions of the proprietor. Though the proprietor and the business are not treated as separate legal entities, the business is supposed to be treated as a separate economic entity. Right? So if the proprietor takes 10,000 rupees from the business's cash in order to meet his personal expenses, then he would have to show it separately in the business. We cannot show it as an expense of the business because that would understate the profit of the business. So that is entity concept. It is essential to make a clear distinction because otherwise it would be impossible to judge the true performance and position of the business. Concept four is conservatism concept. Conservatism concept means the accountant is required to exercise a certain degree of caution when he prepares his financial statements, when he prepares the financial statements. It means that anticipated incomes are not to be accounted for, while anticipated losses have to be accounted for immediately. Okay. So that is the conservatism concept. The answer to this question would be consistency is B. B is accounting policies are not changed frequently. Money measurement is D. Loyalty of the management team is not disclosed in the financial statements. Three is entity concept. It matches with A. Affairs of business are distinguished from the personal affairs of the proprietor. And four is C. Anticipated income should not be recognized in the financial statements. So the answer to this question is C. 
Now we are going to look at four different concepts, four other concepts like accrual, going concern, matching, and cost. We're going to match it with the meanings which are given in column B. Accrual concept. Accrual concept is again a fundamental accounting assumption which is mentioned in accounting standard one. Accrual concept means that transactions have to be recorded or transactions have to be accounted for as and when they occur and not as and when cash is received or cash is paid. For example, a business has to pay rent of 12 months but it has paid rent only for 10 months. Even though it has paid rent only for 10 months and 2 months rent is outstanding, in its profit and loss account it will have to show a rental expense of 12 months. Similarly, when we make a credit sale, we don't receive cash immediately. Nevertheless, we show it as an income as soon as the title to the goods is transferred. So that is the accrual concept or the accrual system of accounting. The next is going concern. Going concern is again a fundamental assumption. Normally, businesses prepare their financial statements under the assumption that there is neither a necessity nor there is any uh, impending event which would necessitate its winding up or closure of the business in the foreseeable future. Okay. So this is why this is why we show a distinction between the current assets and the non-current assets and we classify liabilities as short-term liabilities and long-term liabilities. And it's only because of this going concern assumption that we continue to show fixed assets at their cost. Okay, so that's the going concern assumption. Next, we come to the matching concept. We saw that we saw this concept briefly when we did the previous problem. Uh, matching concept is where we try to match the incomes with the expenses that have been incurred to earn that incomes. It's not possible to match, or it is not required to match every expense with the income because it's not necessary that every expense you incur should generate an income, but when an income is earned, we should match that income with the expense that has been incurred to earn that income. That is the matching concept. Next, we come to the cost concept. Cost concept means that um, assets or fixed assets are um, permitted to be shown at the historical cost at which they are acquired, and uh, they will be depreciated. The cost will be the cost of the fixed asset will be depreciated over its useful life. And the cost method is a good method or is a preferred method of accounting because it is objective, it is highly verifiable. There is no subjectivity involved in the cost concept. So um, the answer to this question, sorry, the answer to this question is A, 1 matches with C. C is provision is made for the amount outstanding for the electricity consumed during the accounting period, immaterial of whether you paid the electricity bill or not. If it is outstanding, it is an expense for the period. Next, going concern matches with D. Fixed assets are kept in the business for generating benefits in future and not for immediate sale. Yes. And three is matching concept matches with A. Advance received from the suppliers is not taken as income or sale. Because uh, you receive advance from the supplier, but you have not incurred an expense to match that income or the receipt. So it will not be treated as an income. So that is 3 matches with A and 4 matches with B. Value of an asset is determined on the basis of the acquisition cost. Right. Now moving on to question number 17. Mr. X has a closing stock costing rupees 10,000 but its market value is rupees 12,000. He shows this stock at rupees 12,000 in the financial statements. He has violated the conservatism principle. Conservatism principle requires businesses to value stock at the lower of cost or the market value because it would be wrong to account for an anticipated income. In this case, X has shown his stock at 12,000 rupees, which means he has accounted for a profit of 2,000 rupees before even earning that profit. Right? So this is in violation of the conservatism principle. Mr. X has sundry creditors of 1 lakh. He has created a reserve for discount at 2% on sundry creditors. This again is a violation of the conservatism principle because X has accounted for an income which he has not yet 
it, which is not yet accrued to him. He is anticipating that his creditors would give him a discount of two percent when he settles them. He might get, he might not get two percent, or he might get an amount which is less than two percent. But by recording for an income upfront, he has inflated that year's profit. Right. So this is in um, a violation of the conservative prince, conservatism principle. Question number 19 is also to do with the conservatism principle. He has sundry debtors, excess sundry debtors of 1 lakh. He has created a provision for doubtful debts at 5%. So here, X is anticipating that 5% of his debts could go bad. He would he anticipates that he'll not be able to realize 5% of this 1 lakh. So he creates a provision for that. So he's anticipating a loss and he's accounting for it upfront. This is in accordance with the conservatism principle. Right. X purchased a building for 1 lakh, but at the end of the accounting period, the market value is lakh and 50. He disclosed the building at lakh and 50 in the financial statements. Well, and now we know that he has violated the historical cost principle. He should have continued to show the cost of the building at 1 lakh, but he has, he has violated that concept and he has shown it at the market value of lakh and 50,000 rupees. X purchased a motorcycle for his son on credit and he recorded as purchase of asset in the business books. Yeah, so what has X done? He has combined. There is no demarcation between the personal transaction and the business transaction. He is showing his personal asset as the asset of the business which is wrong. So he has violated the accounting entity or the separate economic entity principle. Right. Question number 22. X purchased goods for rupees 40,000 of which 25% is for cash. He incurred expenses of rupees 10,000 of which 2,000 is still outstanding and he sold 80% of the goods for rupees 80,000 of which 75% is on credit. What is his profit in the period? So when we calculate profit for Mr. X in this problem, we have to keep in mind the accrual system of accounting. We have to consider the total sales that is both the credit sales and the cash sales. And we also have to consider the total purchases that is the credit purchases and the cash purchases. And secondly, or thirdly, we have to consider the entire expenses of 10,000, even though 2,000 after 10,000 is still outstanding. So let's see how profit can be computed for X. Right. So the sales that X has made is 80,000. We must considered both the credit sales and the cash sales less purchases cost of sales cos is cost of sales right the total goods the cost of the total goods that x has purchased is 40000 rupees but he has sold only 80% of that so the cost that you can match with the sale of 80000 is 32000 rupees which gives us a gross profit. This is a gross profit. Gross profit is 48,000 rupees. And the expenses that he has incurred, including the expenses which are outstanding, is 10,000 rupees. So the profit that he has made, the net profit that he has made, is 38,000 rupees. This is the net profit. Right. So this does not match with any of the options given to us and so the answer is none of the above. Okay. Mr. X purchased goods for rupees 40,000 of which 25% is for cash. He incurred expenses of rupees 10,000 of which 2,000 is still outstanding and he sold all goods for rupees 80,000 of which 75% is on credit. He has calculated the profit at rupees 2,000. Which principle has he violated? Well, by looking at the options that are available to us, I would guess it is the accrual principle. Nevertheless, we can do a small back of the envelope calculation to find out 
how x has arrived at the profit of 2000 rupees let's see how he is how he would have done it so if he has not followed the accrual system of accounting he would have taken sales of he has made cash sales of 20 the total um, sales is 80000 of which one fourth is for cash so sales let us assume he has taken one fourth of 80000 sorry i'll just check the problem yeah right which is 20,000 rupees, right, less purchases, he would have considered only the cash purchases, which is one fourth of 40,000, which is 10,000, okay, sorry. So he would have arrived at a gross profit of 10,000 rupees and he would have considered only the expenses that uh, he has incurred in cash which is 8,000 and hence he has arrived at a profit of 2,000. So this goes to show that he has violated the accrual system of accounting or he has not followed the accrual principle while accounting for his sales and his purchases. Right. Now let's look at problem number 24. Right? See, Mr. X started business on 1st April 2001 and reported the financial performance and financial position of the business on 31st March 2007, being the date of liquidation of the enterprise. What has he violated? See, he has violated a principle called the periodicity principle. See, according to this principle, the entire life of a business is artificially divided into various intervals or periodic intervals, right? Because it is desirable to know on a periodical basis, on a regular basis, about the financial performance and the financial position. So the profit and loss account and the balance sheet, which are generally prepared for external users, will be for a period of 12 months. The financial performance, which is shown by the profit and loss account is prepared for a period of 12 months and the balance sheet which shows the financial position of the business is prepared as at the last date of the period of 12 months covered by the profit and loss account right so however for internal reporting purposes or for internal control purposes financial statements may be prepared for a three month period or a nine month period so in this case he has prepared the balance sheet and the profit and loss account after six years, right? So um, he has violated the uh, periodicity principle. Right. Question number 25. Mr. X valued the inventory on FIFO basis and LIFO basis during 2006 and 2007 respectively. Which concept has he violated? See, during 2006, he followed the FIFO. During 2007, he followed the LIFO, right? which means he has changed his accounting policy of valuing or finding out the cost of the inventory. So he has violated the consistency principle. Yeah, problem number 26 is similar to problem number 25 where during 2006, Y followed the WDV method and during 2007, he has followed the SLM method. So again, there is a change in accounting policy and hence he has violated the consistency principle. It doesn't mean that Y need not should not change. It's just that he has violated the principle. He need not be wrong. If he has sufficient justification for having changed the method from WDB to SLM, then he can very well go ahead. But going forward, he'll have to continue the SM SLM method of depreciating his assets. Question number 27. On Jan 1, Ram paid rent of rupees 10,000. This can be classified as a, an event, B, a transaction, a transaction as well as an event, neither a transaction nor an event. Right? This is a transaction because a transaction is nothing but an exchange, an exchange of goods or services for value. So here Ram is paying money but he has enjoyed the services 
of the, the building or the premises that he has occupied for which he is paying the rent. So this is a transaction, a financial transaction to be specific. Right. 28th question. On March 31, 2007, after sale of goods worth rupees 10,000, there is closing stock of rupees 20,000. This is an event, a transaction, a transaction as well as an event, neither a transaction nor an event. See here, um, you must understand that, you must understand the difference between transaction and an event. A transaction, as we just discussed, is an exchange of goods or services for value. An event is described or it is defined as an outcome of a transaction. So the stock that is left after you make a purchase is an event. The existence of stock is an event. The stock that is left out after the sale is made is an event. The culmination of all the accounting or all the financial transactions during the year is a profit, right? A profit or a loss. That is an event. So in this case, after sale of goods worth 10,000, you have closing stock of 20,000. So that is an event. Right. Prudence principle is an exception to A, matching principle, B, going concern assumption, C, conservatism, D, consistency. Right. So what do we mean by prudence principle? Prudence principle is nothing but a term which is used synonymously with a conservatism principle. So we know that conservatism uh, principle requires us to anticipate all losses but not account for all anticipated incomes so that the assets and the incomes are not overstated. At the same time, conservatism also tells us that we must not make too much provisions for anticipated losses, thereby understating the profit too much so that you know it vitiates the true and fair view that the uh, financial statements are expected to show. So in this case, uh, we'll have to take an example to understand this uh, problem. Let's assume that a company is following the WDV method of account of depreciating its assets, and it feels that by using this method of depreciation, it is understating the depreciation and thereby overstating its profits. If it had followed the SLM method of depreciation, the depreciation charged to the books will be higher than what it is currently charging under the WDV method and hence the profit which and, and it feels that by using the SLM method the profit that is reflected would be a fairer representation of the um, financial transactions. So in this case it would have to shift from its accounting policy of WDV to SLM. So here prudence is an exception to the consistency um, principle. Problem number 30. Purpose of an accounting system includes all of the following except A. Interpret and record the effect of financial transactions. Classify the effects of transactions to facilitate the preparation of reports. Summarize and communicate information to decision makers. Dictate the specific types of business enterprise transactions that the enterprises may engage in. See, an accounting system we need an accounting system to first of all record the transactions. After they are recorded, we need to know the financial position and the financial performance which we get by preparing reports. We first classify the transactions, we summarize them in the form of a trial balance. From the trial balance, we make the balance sheet and the profit and loss account which gives us the, you know, the financial performance and the financial position of the business. right? But if you look at option D, which says dictate the specific types of business enterprise transactions that the enterprises may engage in, that is not the function of an accounting system. That is purely a management decision. So the answer is D. Right. Question number 31. Sale of goods to Ram for 1000 rupees is a cash transaction, a credit transaction, it's a barter or an internal event. See, it's an external transaction and uh, since nothing is specifically given as to whether uh, cash was received, um, it is uh, assumed to be a credit transaction. Right. Selection of an inappropriate accounting policy decision may A. Overstate the performance and financial position of a business entity. 
understate or overstate the performance and financial position of a business entity, overstate the performance of a business entity, understate the financial position of a business entity. Okay. See, first of all, accounting policies refer to specific accounting principles and the methods of applying those principles. For example, uh, accounting policy, uh, let us assume, let us take the example of um, value in stock. Right? The accounting principle is you have to value stock at the lower of cost or the market value. And to arrive at the cost, there are two methods. You can either use the FIFO method or the weighted average cost method. Right? So this is an accounting principle which tells us, this is an accounting policy which tells us what is the accounting principle and what is the method to follow that principle. And when we select an accounting policy, accounting policy, uh, right, I mean, when we select an accounting policy, we have to keep the considerations of materiality, prudence, and another concept called substance over form in mind. Right? So because an accounting policy decision affects our assets, our liabilities, our incomes and expenses. So an inappropriate accounting policy would affect our financial position and the financial performance. So answer is B. Okay. Question number 33. Subjectivity is involved in A. Cost principle B. Money measurement principle C. Accounting entity principle and D. Prudence. The first three concepts are highly objective, so which leaves us with prudence, which means that while applying the concept of prudence, a lot of subjectivity is involved. Cost principle is highly objective. It's very simple to apply. You know the acquisition cost and you carry your assets at the historical cost. Money measurement principle, you know what are the items that you can measure. You know the items that you cannot measure. So again, there is no subjectivity there. Accounting entity means there has to be a clear distinction between personal transactions and business transactions. Again, there is no subjectivity there. But where does subjecti subjectivity arise? When we apply the prudence concept, when we make estimates. So that is when we have to make a lot of assumptions. And uh, so the answer to this question is D. Right. The assets and incomes are not overstated and the liabilities and losses are not understated in accordance with the prudence principle. Answer is D. Why? Because, yeah, so um, when we uh, apply the prudence principle, we, are, we make sure that we do not account for anticipated incomes, but we make sure that we account for anticipated losses. But again, yeah, the businesses are cautioned that they should not be providing for too many losses or they should not be making too many provisions so as to um, understate the profits, right, and to create so as so that they create secret reserves out of this. So that is um, the prudence principle. Yeah, question number thirty-five. The going concern concept is the underlying basis for stating fixed assets at their realizable values, disclosing the market value of securities, disclosing the sales and other operating information in the income statement. None of the above. Right. We must understand that going concern basis or the going concern concept is the underlying basis for three things. One is the classification of assets as current and non-current, classification of liabilities as short-term and long-term liabilities, and thirdly, carrying the assets at their historical cost. If the going concern concept is not followed, only then businesses state their assets and liabilities at their breakup values or the net realizable values. So answer to this question is D, none of these. Question number 36. The production manager reports to the top management that production for the year 2007 is 200 tons, but actual production is lakh and 99,000.9 kilograms. What has he followed? Right, see here, this is, uh, he has followed the concept of materiality, right? So what has he done? He has just rounded off and instead of reporting lakh and 
2.9 kilograms, he has rounded it off to 200 tons. What is material? What do, when do you say that something is material? An item is said to be material when the omission or misstatement of it is likely to affect the decision of the user. Here, the top management is not likely to have is not likely to make a significantly different decision by by looking at 200 tons instead of looking at a number like lakh and 99,000.9 kilograms. But if the production manager had reported 19,900 tons instead of 200, sorry, 19,900 kilograms instead of 200 tons, yes, that is a material misstatement. So the answer is B. 37. Users of accounting information include A. Creditors, B. Lenders, C. Customers, all of the above. Okay. See, all of the above is the answer because accounting information is useful to creditors, lenders, customers. How is it useful to creditors? Creditors are people to whom the business owes money. So creditors want to know if the money that is owed to them will in fact come back to them. So they'll be interested in knowing the liquidity position of the business. They'll be interested in knowing what is the cash the business has. Does it have readily realizable current assets so that it can meet their claim. Lenders, lenders, examples of lenders would be banks, people who have subscribed to the debentures or bonds. So they would be interested in knowing, the lenders would be interested in knowing the long term solvency of the business and also interested in knowing the cash flow position of the business. Customers, yes, they are also interested in knowing if the business is sound. So the answer is D, all of the above. Question number 38, which one of the following is correct? The term purchases includes the purchase of fixed assets for cash as well as on credit. The term sales includes the sales of fixed assets for cash as well as on credit. The term opening stock means goods lying unsold at the end of previous accounting period. The term closing stock means the goods lying unsold at the beginning of the current accounting period. Okay. So what does the term purchases mean? Purchases does not mean buying a fixed asset. Purchases means obtaining goods in which you are dealing with. That is goods, you buy goods either for the purpose of use in production or you buy goods for the purpose of resale. For example, a person who deals in uh, say products like shampoos, soaps, detergents, when he buys stock of these goods, he'll call it purchases. And when he sells these goods, he will call it sales. But let's assume this man buys a delivery van in order to deliver these goods to the various outlets. Then the delivery van is not a purchase. It will be treated as, a, as an asset. Okay, So that is the distinction between purchases of goods in which the business deals in and the purchase of a fixed asset. Opening stock means the stock which is lying unsold with the business at the beginning of the beginning of the current year or uh, it could mean the closing stock or it means the closing stock of um, the goods at the end of the previous year let's take an example let us say the financial year of a business commences on 1st january 2012 and it ends on 31st december 2012 Right. As on 31st December 2012, it has stock which is unsold of rupees 20,000. So this is the closing stock of the financial year ending on 31st December 2012. And this 20,000 is the opening stock for the financial year that commences on 1st January 2013. So the answer to this question is C. The term opening stock means the goods that are lying unsold at the end of the previous accounting period. Okay. The next three, four questions, we'll be discussing the various bases of measurement of assets and liabilities. Let's look at this problem. It says, X purchased a machinery amounting to rupees 5 lakhs on 1st April 2001. On 31st March 2000, Seven, the similar machinery could be purchased for rupees 10 lakhs, but the realizable value of the machinery that was purchased on 1 4 2001 was estimated at rupees 6 lakhs. 
the present discounted value of the future net cash flows um, was um, rupees 7 lakhs. What is the current cost of the machinery? Right. See, current cost means how much you have to spend right now to purchase a machinery, a per to purchase a similar machinery. Yeah, that's given to us in the problem. It says that a similar machinery could be purchased for rupees 10 lakhs. So the current cost of this machinery is rupees 10 lakhs. Right. It's the same information that's given to us. Suppose X decides to find out or X decides to measure the machinery based on the present value of the machinery. So what do we mean by present value? See, at this stage, you just need to understand that present value is a method the present value method is a method where we recognize the time value of money and present value is nothing but the discounted value of the future cash flows that the asset is expected to generate. That is given to us as rupees 7 lakhs. So the answer is 7 lakhs. Right. Question number 41 says, what is the historical cost of the machinery? Yes, we know this really well. Historical cost is nothing but what we spent to acquire the machinery way back in on uh, 1st April 2001. So X spent 5 lakhs to acquire this machinery and so the historical cost of this machinery is rupees 5 lakhs. Right. Question number 42, what is the realizable value of the machinery? Realizable value means how much would you realize if you disposed of the machinery as at the valuation date right see here the valuation date is 31st March 2007 that's nothing but the date on which we want to prepare the balance sheet right and it says that the realizable value that you that is if you sell if you decide to sell that machinery on that date you would realize six lakhs which means that is the realizable value of the machinery so answer is six lakhs All right I think we've come to the last question Question number 43. X purchased merchandise worth rupees 1 lakh and sold 60% for 90,000 and 40% of the remaining was sold for 60,000 rupees. The market value of the remaining merchandise was 20,000 rupees. He valued the stock at 24,000. Which concept has he violated? Yes. The options are realization cost, matching principle, consistency principle, none of the above. Well, he has violated the conservatism principle or the prudence principle, as you might want to call it. So the answer is D. He should have valued it at the lower of cost and the net realizable value, but he has valued it at uh, 24,000 and hence he has violated the conservatism principle or the uh, prudence principle. Right? So with this, we come to the end of uh, today's session and I mm -hmm. hope it was useful. In case you have queries, please feel free to mail me at queries at graymatteracademics.com. Right, so till next time, see you. Bye.